Hudson Regiment arrived at Pittsburgh Landing on the night of April 5th, marched out here in camp, and then were attacked the next morning. The 15th Michigan Regiment, also a new regiment, arrived at Pittsburgh Landing on the 5th. Their colonel, Colonel John Oliver, got them off of their steamboats and arranged around Pittsburgh Landing there. He decided to send three companies out to their new camp and get the camp set up so that it would be ready when the regiment got there. So three, so three companies of the 15th came out and they set up their camp, but the regiment did not come out. As a result, when the attack came on the morning of April 6th, the next morning, the 15th was back at Pittsburgh Landing. Now Oliver got, Oliver heard the firing and he got orders from Prentice, get your regiment up here. He had not yet been issued ammunition. The 15th had no ammunition. But Colonel Oliver, he heard the firing, he said, okay, here we come. And the 15th Michigan marched all the way out here they took position on the left of the 18th Wisconsin. Chalmers Brigade deployed along in here. They were followed by General Jackson's Brigade, who also came in later on a northeast orientation, had to reorganize down here in this low area, and then advance. They advanced and they took the 15th Michigan under fire, and there those Michigan troops stood at order arms watching the enemy fire at them without the, enemy, the ability to fire back. Colonel Oliver asked General Prentice what they should do. General Prentice's response was, your bayonets must be good for something. <laughs> Yet General Jackson did not charge this position, he didn't have to. Uh, they just kept firing upon the Michigan Regiment and the Michigan Regiment kept taking casualties without the ability to return fire and finally Colonel Oliver uh, simply ordered his men to about face and retreat into this ravine and then he organized them to march back to Pittsburgh Landing and find ammunition himself. So he took the 15th Michigan, rather than getting butchered here on top of the hill, Colonel Oliver took them back to Pittsburgh Landing, marched them out of the fight. As a result, when General Jackson advanced to this position, there was nobody here to fight him. And indeed, he was able to get around the flank of the 18th Wisconsin, and the misery of the 18th Wisconsin was further multiplied by the fact that Jackson's troops could fire at them as they were retreating in the flank. At this point, orders are to stop. Orders are to stop. The commander of the Confederate Army, General Albert <coughs> Sidney Johnston, is nearby. In fact, he rides up into the 18th Wisconsin's camp, that new camp they set up last night. Right after Chalmers' brigade charges in there, they charge in there, they drive the 18th Wisconsin out, they shoot that regiment up, and then the men fall out. The men fall out and they begin looting the camp. Gladden's brigade drives their enemies away. They fall out and they begin looting the camp. Shaver's brigade drives Colonel Peabody's brigade from their camps. As soon as Peabody's brigade retreats, in disorganized fashion over the Barnesfield area and to the north, all of those troops fall out and begin sacking the Yankee camps. They've been marching for three days in the rain. They've eaten all of their rations. They've been without food for probably 24 hours. They didn't sleep the night before. They probably didn't sleep any of the three nights okay. getting rained on. They're completely exhausted, and they have used their last rush of adrenaline to win this battle. They fall out, and they sack the camps. They eat 
the breakfast that is cooking over the Yankee fires. They start to exchange some of their uh, uh, flintlock muskets for some of the higher quality muskets they find laying around on the ground. That that starts to happen. Um, and the Confederates lose crucial time. They lose crucial time. They have not turned the left flank of the enemy. In fact, General Johnson has just found out from his chief engineer, uh, Jeremy Gilmer, that there is a division of Union troops on the hill to the east. All of these regiments, all of these brigades, moving to the northeast, folding into the line, all of this disorganization, all of this attempt to find the left flank of the Union Army. They finally found it, they thought. It was the 15th Michigan. They marched away. Jackson charged. Chalmers charged. They cleaned out the camp. They turned the left flank of the enemy. No, says Captain Gilmer. I've just discovered a division of Union troops across the ravine on top of the next hill. So, General Johnson needs to organize a new plan. He needs to find that left flank, the real left flank. He needs to turn it. The division of Union troops is not a division. It's a single brigade. It's uh, Colonel David Stewart's brigade uh, of General Sherman's division. They're camped over here. And so two brigades, Jackson's and Chalmers, reorganize, pull back out of these camps, reorganize, march all the way back to the Bark Road so that they can march all the way around and attack that position. It's going to take time. It's going to take time that the Confederates don't have. But that brings us to the end of the attack on Prentice's division. The Confederates have won. They've overwhelmed Prentice's division and they've captured Prentice's camp. They are winning. They are winning. But what happens next is going to help decide the result of the battle. They lose this time by falling out and sacking the Union camp, about 45 minutes. The Federals improve that time by reorganizing in a thicket due, to the, due north of here and in falling back to the crossroads area and reorganizing for a stand there. But as far as General Prentice's camp is concerned, they've captured it. Prentice's division has been defeated and driven. And this part, this phase of the Battle of Shiloh is at an end. Why does Sherman have a, a unit way down here on the far left, so far from the so rest? Far from it? I can't explain that. But first, I want to say something. We've reached the end of our program. Uh, it's the end of our time. Uh, this was a one-way program. It didn't make a loop. <laughs> so we're as far from our cars as we're going to be. Yesterday, I walked from here to where our cars are, and it took me 13 minutes. So if we leave now, those of you who want to get on Dr. Jeff Gench's 10 o'clock program starting at Ray Springs, we can make it. In fact, you can make it and sit down and, you know, take a blow and drink a water or something like that and and rest a little bit before we start. Yeah. Um, and, but for those who like, want to do a little Q&A, let's go about five minutes and then head in that direction. The question, why is Stewart's brigade all the way over here? Uh, Stewart's brigade belongs to General Sherman's 5th Division. General Sherman's 5th Division is stationed a mile in this direction. Prentice is between Sherman and Stewart. It's because Sherman arrived first. When Sherman arrived, it was his job to guard the roads leading up to Pittsburgh Landing. So he took three of his brigades to guard the main Corinth Road, but he detached Stewart to guard the Hamburg to Savannah Road, the, what's called the River Road. So Stuart made his camp over there to guard the Hamburg-Savannah Road. As <coughs> Prentice arrived and he starts building his division, 
Again, Prentice didn't arrive with a full division. He's building it here. They fill in the gap between Stuart and Sherman. Stuart would have eventually rejoined Sherman. Could have been within any day, you know, just a matter of days. But on the 6th, he was still camped in his original camp. Were the Confederate officers uh, tolerant of the, their men uh, robbing the camps and eating and all that? Or did they say, hey, let's get going here, yeah. we got to get going? Were the Confederate officers tolerant of the men falling out and sacking the camps? The answer is no. They were horrified. They were absolutely horrified by what was happening, but a lot, but they were doing it themselves. Uh, a lot of the junior officers were, were sacking the camp as well. When General Johnston came up into the camp, he was absolutely furious. He said, we've got to get going, we've got to get going. Uh, and then uh, some of his men, uh, there's a story, some of his men came out with, uh, with some uh, uh, overcoats. One of his staff officers came out with, hey, look, I found overcoats for everybody. And, uh, you know, Johnson scolded him, sir, we did not come here for, to loot. We did not come here to steal. He sees that everybody is exhausted, that he's, you know, his men are, he's insulting his own men who just won a battle. And so he, he's very cleverly, and I think this is great leadership from Johnston, uh, he reaches down and he picks up a uh, single tin cup, a single tin coffee cup from, uh, that's lying on a pile. And he shakes it over his head and he goes, this shall be my part of the spoils. And the men cheer and, oh yeah, okay, you're all right, you're all right by us, Johnson. And so they start to get reorganized, but they lose 45 minutes. They lose 45 crucial minutes at least uh, reorganizing. Let's start making that trip. Got it. it should be about 15 to 20 minutes from here to your car. Straight west, cross country.